This is the Lac de Bois Range, a few kilometers north of Kamloops, British Columbia. During the late Pleistocene epoch, 20,000 to 10,000 years ago, it was covered by about 1,500 meters of ice. The erosional and depositional impact of this ice sheet has been significant and dramatic. The sheer force of the advancing ice front literally bulldozed over the tops of many mountains. These two mountains overlooking the city of Kamloops were rounded off by the ice front. Sand, silt, clay, and gravels were compacted by the massive weight of the ice riding over them and formed a hard layer of basal till. When the climate began to warm again, the ice started to melt. The vast amounts of ice water deposited gravelly and sandy sediments in stratified layers on top of the basal till in formations known as eskers and canes. Immediately following the ice retreat, there was a period of time when little or no vegetation protected the land from the wind. Strong winds whipped the soil from the unprotected areas to expose rocky outcrops and deposited aeolian silts and fine sands known as lus. Ever since the glacier retreat, the climate has fluctuated a bit, but has remained essentially the same. All of this is revealed in the soil profile. The glacier, as it moved ahead, deposited what we call the basal till up to about here. This is hard material, compacted on top of any bedrock that lies underneath here. Then as the glacier was melting, it carried debris in it and it dumped this material, which is loose, on top of the basal till. And then because there was barren areas at the edge of the glacier, there was uh, opportunity for wind to pick up all kinds of uh, sands and silts. And this is a wind-blowing deposit that was the last deposited, giving us a very fine sandy loam uh, surface material. The Lac de Bois Range is in one of the most arid parts of British Columbia. The annual precipitation is about 250 millimeters, while spring summer temperatures average 16 degrees Celsius. As a result, this range suffers an annual drought in the late summer. Grasses can survive this annual drought, something trees can't do. Decomposition of the grass roots forms humus, which turns the A horizon dark brown or black, hence the term chernism, which is derived from the Russian word for black earth. The soil at this site belongs to the brown chernism grade group because the top 20 centimeter horizon of soil is brown and contains less than 1% organic matter derived from dying grass roots. We can show you here the most important grass that grows on these soils. It's the blue bunch wheatgrass, or agropyrin spicatum. It's ubiquitous. It occurs on most every uh, normal grassland in British Columbia and as far south as Mexico. It's a robust grass, as you see here. It uh, developed uh, this side of the Rocky Mountains, where there were few grazing animals, and that's allowed it to grow to this height. And it's the one that produces the roots. You see these fine fibrous roots here. And every year it produces a new generation of roots, which decay and produce the organic matter that accumulates in the top 10 to 20 centimeters of this profile. In contrast to the tall blue bunch wheatgrass, we have on this same site a small bunch grass. It's actually a blue grass. This is <clears throat> usually its maximum height less than two inches and in, a, in a balance with that the roots only go very shallow down a few inches into the soil so this little plant has to complete its life cycle by the time the soil has dried out to that depth and you can see it's done so here this is the end of may and this this thing is dried up and dormant the level of biological activity in this soil is lower than in soils with more moderate temperature and moisture regimes most organic matter decomposition occurs in the wetter spring and fall seasons when moisture levels are higher. The water from the rains and the snow melt has had another effect on the brown chernism, that is the leaching of carbonate salts 
out of the surface horizons into the lower horizons to the average depth of moisture penetration. This accumulation is demonstrated with 10% hydrochloric acid, which reacts with the calcium carbonate to produce carbon dioxide. Where the acid doesn't react, it indicates that the calcium carbonate has been leached down into a lower horizon. This leaching causes the loss of a major pH buffering agent from the top horizons and will have effects on soil fertility. The Lac de Bois Range is ranching country and has been ever since the first cattle and horses arrived with the Hudson's Bay Company. Over the decades, livestock were allowed to roam freely over the range in increasing numbers. Unfortunately, these tall grasses, which evolved under a history of non-grazing, were not able to recuperate from the foraging livestock and the ranges were quickly depleted. Now the reason this blue bench is so easily depleted is because its foliage is up there and if you graze it down to there you've got over 80 percent of its photosynthetic area is gone so that's very hard on it. You contrast that with this little one here you see it's already dormant but it only grows so high and the cattle really can't hardly get anything of it so it escapes grazing damage that way. The lower part of this range has actually stayed in good condition due to a lack of water. Cattle are unwilling to graze more than one to two kilometers from any pond or slough. But as we travel up to slightly higher elevations in the range, the number of ponds and sloughs increases, and so do the number of cattle grazing. The effect of heavy grazing is shown by this fenced-in area built by Agriculture Canada in 1959. Inside the fence, the blue bunch has recovered, and we feel sure that these were old, old, depleted plants that have been given a chance to grow back again. Whereas we look outside the fence here, there's just a few of them that have either survived or are maybe still on their way to recovery. So that kind of dramatically illustrates what the heavy grazing pressure, again, grazing it every year, all year long, but especially during the bloom period of the Blue Bunch wheatgrass. With increasing elevation, temperatures are cooler and moisture effectiveness is greater. The soils change progressively in color from brown at the lowest elevations to dark brown at the middle elevations and to black at the higher elevations. The darkness of the soil reflects the increasing amount of organic matter, which in turn is dependent on the amount of vegetation. The big sage and blue bunch wheatgrass give way to bluffs of aspen and new species of grasses and forbs. The uh, new grass that we pick up that's a very important one here is that tall growing one that's headed out that's called a fescue, rough fescue. That one comes in on our very moistest sites on these black soils. There are other grasses amongst uh, the rough fescue that are not yet headed out. There's a whole series of two or three needle grasses. And we get bluegrass uh, coming in where the, when the rough fescue is grazed out, then the uh, Kentucky bluegrass seems to get a chance, especially in the moister sites. Uh, if we can look over here to this little shrub, that's a, an aspen that's uh, germ germinating, or not germinating, it's, it's a root uh, sucker, suckering from the roots of a nearby aspen clump. And when we have a series of moist years, these aspen suckers will move out into the grassland, but they may not always survive because then we're followed with a series of drought, drought years. So the aspen clumps more or less stay the same. The, there's a few other forbs here. This one in particular is a, we call it a lomatium. It has, uh, it grows in the moist sites. And it has a bulbous root, one that the Indians could use for food. I think they had to parboil it because it was bitter, but Anyway, that was one thing they could use. And that's about the main thing, but there's a lot of other little forbs. You see, here we have a little flower that you would never see down in the lower grassland. And there's several of these kind that come in here, just a whole host of varieties of plants. It gives you a complete cover here as contrasted with the lower site.
The parent material for this soil is the same as the brown turnism we looked at earlier. A capping of lus on top of sands and gravels, all over compact basal till. But the increased vegetative growth and deposition of organic matter has formed another churnism great group. This is a black churnism soil here, and one of the main features of it is the accumulation of the organic matter in the surface horizon here. It's the same process as we saw in the brown soil, but it's much more intense here. You can see the color contrast, especially on this wetted portion. And you can see the uh, numerous fibrous roots. They even extend quite deep into the profile. The organic matter here will be about 10% in this upper portion of the AH horizon. And it gradually diminishes as you go down. It, it, there is not a really a sharp break. It just gradually tapers off to about 1 or 2% down in the uh, upper part of the B horizon. Biological activity in the black is greater than in the brown churnism due to more moderate temperatures and increased moisture effectiveness. Also, the leaching of soluble salts out of the top horizons into the lower horizons of the black soil can be shown. The main difference is that the greater moisture has leached the salts to a much lower depth in the black soil than in the brown soil. Okay, to demonstrate this uh, leaching of the carbonate, we can do it with the HCl, hydrochloric acid, again. Um, at this depth, there's no reaction. We go down, and then we find here a rock that was embedded at this location. It has the white limestone on the underside of it. And that's where we first find the accumulation of limestone. So it's been leached out of the upper part of the profile right down to, to this level. The transition of soils from brown to dark brown to black has occurred over the space of a few kilometers here at Lac de Bois. In the Prairie Provinces, however, this same transition occurs, but over a distance of several hundred kilometers. The difference between our brown and our black here in elevation is about 700 meters, and that accounts for the difference in climate, the greater moisture effectiveness, so we can build up a greater uh, thicker AH and a higher organic matter in the AH. On the prairies, this occurs over a wide latitude from, uh, so we could compare brown soils in the southern part of the prairies, say south of Lethbridge. Then you have to go a few hundred kilometers north, near probably Saskatoon, to find our black soils. So on the prairies, it's a latitudinal change. In BC here, it's usually an altitudinal change. The lushness of the vegetation at this altitude is somewhat misleading. It would appear this land could graze hundreds of cattle with little effect on the vegetation. However, as at the lower elevations, this area too experiences an annual summer drought. To manage the entire Lac de Bois range properly, the cattle are rotated through the established pastures in a cycle that avoids grazing the grasses at the susceptible bloom stage. In the spring, the cattle graze the lower grasslands first. When the blue bunch wheatgrass begins to bloom in May, the cattle are moved up into this rangeland area. They stay here until about the middle of June, when these grasses begin to bloom. Then they are moved into the moisture forested range for the rest of the summer. And when their forest is finished, say, uh, they come out of the very high forest off the wetlands, they come down here in late September, October. There's still grass here left that'll maintain cows for a couple of months. So that, that fits into a nice cycle of uh, range management. <laughs>